Okay, I closed the door because the dogs were going crazy barking, which kind of ruined the letter when I tried to read it the first time. Uh, again, he is writing to his sister, Mrs. Seville, in England. This time we're on July 7th, so about three months have passed, and we are picking up with a new, new letter. <clears throat> I write a few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced on my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchantman now on its homeward voyage from Archangel, more fortunate than I, who may not see my native land perhaps for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region toward which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales which blow us speedily toward those shores which I so ardently desire to attain, breathe a degree of renovating warmth which I had not expected. No incidents have hitherto befallen us that would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales and the springing of a leak are accidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record, and I shall be well content if nothing worse happens during our voyage. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for my own sake as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, persevering, and prudent, but success shall crown my endeavors. Why for not? Thus far I have gone, tracing a secure way over pathless seas, the very stars themselves being witness and testimonies of my triumph. Why not still proceed over the untamed yet obedient element? What can stop the determined heart and a resolved will of man? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus, but I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister. That is a very happy, happy cheer to your letter. Interesting question is, why did the tone of that letter change? By the way, the answer to that is going to be more in Robert's personality than what's going on outside of Robert. But let's go straight into letter four. Again, to Mrs. Seville in England. Now we are August 5th, so we're about a month later. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice, which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving her the sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compassed round by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. Okay, time out. Let's stop and think about that. What does ice, what does water do as it freezes? Well, because it makes a matrix, if you have this much water, when it freezes, you have that much ice. The matrix kind of pushes that out. So if you have ice all around the ship and the ship has almost no water to float in and more ice is forming, as that ice forms and expands, what's going to happen to the ship in the middle? In the middle of the Arctic Ocean, in or the Arctic Circle in the Arctic Ocean, that's not a little dangerous. He is describing a situation in which everyone on that ship could very easily die. The question is, why does he present it the way he did? Is this a brother trying to underplay the danger for a sister, or is he clueless and does he not recognize the fact that he is in grave danger of dying? And that's the question that's a little harder to answer. <clears throat> About two o'clock, the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention. 
and diverted our solicitude from our own situation, we perceived a low carriage fixed on a sled and drawn by dogs passed toward the north at a distance of half a mile, a being which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sled and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveler with our telescopes until he was lost among the distant inequalities of ice. Something with the shape of a man, but a gigantic form, so he's not a man. Hmm, wonder what that could be. Dun, dun, dun. This appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundreds miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not in reality so distant as we had supposed. So he's assuming there has to be land nearby that the sled has come from. Seems a reasonable assumption. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. Now, here's the other thing. If the ice only formed the night before because they had been sailing in open waters, that means this moron is driving a dog sled over newly formed ice, which might not be firm. We have more than one stupid person in this story. About two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before night the ice broke and freed our ship. We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sled like that we had seen before, which had drifted toward us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive. Oh, and the other dogs all drowned because of this idiot dragging them on soft ice. Why is it I always feel worse for the dogs than I do the people? I totally kill the people, but leave the dogs alone. Only one dog remained alive. But there was a human being within it whom the sailors were persuading to enter our vessel. He was not, as the other travelers seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but a European. When I appeared on deck, the master said, Here is our captain, and he will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound? <laughs> you may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery toward the North Pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Consented to not drown in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Okay. Good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen and his body dreadfully emaciated by fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man in such a wretched condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to small, swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees, he recovered and ate a little soup, which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and when I often feared that his sufferings had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, 
I removed him to my own cabin and attended on him as much as my duty would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness. But there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness toward him or does him the, the most trifling surface, service, his whole countenance is lighted up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw equaled. Ah, oh, he has a man crush. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppress him. There go my dogs. I'm not stopping and restarting this again. Seriously, I have read this letter enough, so you can put up with the idiot one and idiot two. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men who wished to ask him a thousand questions, but I would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity in a state of body and mind whose restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom, and he replied, to seek one who fled from me. And did the man who you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sled with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, I said, I have doubtless excited your curiosity as well as that of these good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly, it would indeed be very impertinent and inhumane of me to trouble you with any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet, you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after this, he inquired if I thought that the breaking up the ice had destroyed the other sled. I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty, for the ice had not broken until near midnight, and the traveler might have arrived at a place of safety before that time, but of this I could not judge. From this time, a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. He manifested the greatest eagerness to be upon deck, to watch for the sled which had before appeared. But I have persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I have promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Mm. So we now have that that new guy is obsessed with the demon, the creature who was in front of him. Such is my journal of what relates to the strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but it is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except myself enters his cabin. His manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although I believe they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I began to love him as a brother, and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, being even now in wreck, so attractive and amiable. Yeah, that's not a little weird. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide, wide ocean. Yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue to journal concerning the stranger at intervals, should I have any fresh instance to record. Yeah. Okay, we're going to break there. 
This does not say the end of letter four because at this point it almost becomes more diary like because he can't uh, mail the letters. So we're kind of, we are leaving the middle of letter four, but I have to go get something to drink and figure out why my dogs are barking. May have gotten a delivery. So we are leaving before we read the August 13th letter. <laughs> 